Never read through any of them. I forgot what they said. Man, dude, you got deep on a bunch of them where you well, were like, the one, what am I hold reading on, now? You just said you were a tank from the waist down in the show. <laughs> I got tire tracks. Uh, it's like, time out. What? What? I, I got tire like, tracks. Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T MLS Studios in Midtown Manhattan. I'm Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, David Goss, Matt Doyle. Yes, sir. It's my last show of 2019, guys. Is that why you're wearing a beanie? Like, you're uh, not even mm, here? I'm pretty sure I wore this sweatshirt on, like, three previous shows. It's, so it's, I'm just The last done. show I'm just you came up. on and you I'm looked done. in the camera and you said, beanie looks unprofessional, and you left and put a hat on. And this time you are wearing the beanie. Mm. It's, it's a different... Beanie. It's a toque. It's, uh, what? Stop, dude. Yeah. What's that? Stop. That's the, I learned this, this word a couple of years Canadians ago. That's what those types say. of hats are called. No. no, that's what Canadians call them. That's, all right, that's fair. Part of our part of our audience, Fair. Canadian. Your overlords. It's okay. That's fine. Uh, they're the second largest audience we have, so it's yeah. still a beanie in these parts. And I didn't bring a hat. I think so. it's a beanie. Okay, fine. All right. I'm Googling what a beanie is. right Nordic, now. Oh, Scandinavian, God. whatever. Yeah, that's what they call him in the Faroe Islands. Ah, uh, yes. We have a big interview coming up. Sasha Kleshin stopped by the oh, ATC and West Studios. <laughs> oh my God. And he talked to me all about his entire career from the very, very beginnings, playing like pickup with with his dad's friends at all church in. when he's 12 years old through Seton Hall. Shout out to uh, the Pirates through MLS to Anderlecht, Chivas USA, back to the Red Bulls. Uh, that time he got cut from the World Cup squad, it got a little emotional in the studio. So stick around for that one. We have a quick show for you here. We did have some mail off the top, and there's an elephant in the room that I, I guess we have to address. Uh, Bobby Warshaw. Bill Carroll in uh, section 132, that didn't used to be where Bill Carroll sat, right? No, it was. It was? Always? Yeah, wow. I think so. Okay. He says, wow, great way to end a show. No desserts, no pies. Merry effing Christmas, Bobby Warshaw. <laughs> it took until mid-December to find the downer of the year. I didn't feel like it was a downer. I thought it was a fun show. Uh, my Red Bulls may not have had the best year, but Extra Time did. Thank you, Bill. Uh, see you in 2020. We do have a couple more shows, just FYI on that one. Triple D on Thursday. It's going to be Doyle, Dave, and Darius Barnes. So you have a trialist coming in. How do you guys feel about that? How are you going to treat Darius in these parts? Uh, me and Doyle will probably take him out drinking the night before. We'll nice. all be drinking until uh -huh. 4 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Wake up the next day. Turns out we've been doing shots of water. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you didn't know training started at 8, 8 a.m.? Yeah. We told you 1 p.m.? Exactly. Cool. Cool. This is how you survive in we'll, the Bundesliga. Yeah, we'll see how Darius uh, does with that one. And then we had a text. Wait, what happened to Bobby? Also, Pi is amazing. Shut up, Bobby, which was uh, the best Bobby-related text. We've gotten mm -hmm. all year long. Rachel Davis in the YouTube comment section, where it is actually kind of popping uh, sometimes, says, I'm confused. Is Bobby leaving the show? You guys made it sound like that's the case. And then Andrew said we'd find out later why the intro was all Bobby quotes. And then Bobby made a reference to not going out without doubling down on a com. And then a reference to there being a tray of brownies for Bobby. And then we never got any explanation. And then Bobby signed off with, quote, it's been real, guys, quote, end quote, like he's never going to be back on the show again can we get an explanation and i promise you we will have a full explanation at the very very end of this show no bits bobby would not allow it although he did end the previous show with a bit about pie pointed out rob gamash so i, I don't know what that's that's about. like an ncis level that's, investigation yeah but let's, i mean let's, we, let's get into right, the soccer right, we gotta go soccer we'll get, we'll get, get to bobby the show. in a little bit yeah. he's important we know that uh, let's talk el tanque lucas cavallini he is now a Vancouver Whitecap. The fee reported by Jeff Carlisle was $6 million. Merry Christmas, Liga MX. They are just collecting checks for strikers from MLS teams at this point. That's like, what, 15 mil reportedly between Alan Polito and Cavallini. And you have Gustavo Bo back. And I mean, it goes on and on and on. Maybe Roger Martinez as well to enter Miami. 26-year-old Canadian forward, but really 27. His birthday is <laughs> December 28th. So he's really 27. Yeah, well, he's... He's 27 uh, right he's now. Really, yeah. <laughs> no, he's, he's really 27. Headline, uh, will be 28 yeah. one day. <laughs> right, right. Striker signs. Uh, born in Toronto, so he's going all the way west to Vancouver. He seems really happy to be there. said he's happy to be back home. He's been with Puebla last three years in Mexico, 28 goals in 81 games. They really teased this. They're all about it. It's their big signing. We're excited about it. We've been talking about it for a long time, whether it was Sporting Kansas City or the Vancouver Whitecaps. What's your uh, what's your take? What's your level of excitement? Uh, my 
Well, Vancouver signed a player, so that's pretty exciting. Does it get you excited? Like, yeah, it is does. this palpable excitement, or is it more like, oh yeah, Lucas Cavallini would be a good signing? Maybe the second one, but that's excited for me. I don't go that high sometimes. But <laughs> he is he's a talented player in a position of need for them for a club that hasn't signed talented players in positions of need a lot over the last few years. I think he's got a low floor in Major League Soccer. I think he'll score goals. He's got a high floor. Sorry, yes, he's got no, a high like, floor. Wait, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. I think he'll score goals. I think he'll he'll make it harder for defenses. I think he'll make it easier for his teammates, whether the runs he makes, whether occupying defenders physically, whatever it is. I think he'll make the guys around him better. No, I don't know who the guys around him are. I really like Wang and Baum, and that's about it. But I think in general, for what we thought Vancouver was going to do, this is a pretty good sign. He's, st- he's a top five striker in CONCACAF, wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, he's definitely, he definitely, I don't have the math in the Jimenez, top of my head, but like Chicharito. He's, he's around there. I mean, he, Jonathan David, I think you have to include Jonathan that David one. for sure. Then Is somebody going to say Jordan Morris here. Yeah, Jordan Morris gonna, is a winger. Okay. Right. Like, like, jo- I, guess. I think a, a fully fit Josie is better than him, but Josie's he's rarely in the, He's fully in the conversation. Fit. No doubt about <laughs> it. Right now I would take Cavallini over Josh Sargent. I, I think a year from now, maybe that changes, but like, this is a, this is a really good signing. This is a guy who has scored everywhere he's gone. He has been available everywhere he's gone. He doesn't get hurt, which is su- like such a big thing, especially uh, in this league. We see how teams without their best guys tend to fall off really quickly. So that that is huge for Vancouver. And the track record, as we all know, for, for guys coming from Mexico, from coming specifically from Liga MX to MLS, has been very, very good recently. Um, so I, I love this signing from Vancouver's point of view. He He's called El Tanque because he's built like David. You know, he, he's got nice. kind of a bowling ball type of uh, <laughs> type of shape, and he, he uses yeah, that. You see me from the did waist you, down. I was yeah. say, oh, 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 <laughs> wow. Well, I <laughs> that, was, that was your quads <laughs> and hamstrings, correct? Those are my tank. Uh, yeah, yeah you're, you're your tracks. Tracks. Treads. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Words, but he, words. but he, like, he's super mobile too. And you see it. I, I mean, you saw it with the goal he scored against the U.S. in October, where he was able to get behind the defense. Um, and you see it, especially defensively. I, this is a guy who I thought, like, I wanted Sporting Kansas City to sign him a couple years ago when they were still a pressing team because he does all of that work. Um, now, I don't think this means Vancouver is going to be a pressing team necessarily, but maybe this gives us it gives them the ability for five or ten minutes a game right before the half, suddenly you spring a high press on, on a team, uh, kind of unsuspecting, and that could give – look. Vancouver is still a team that has to win at the margins. They're not going to throw out a team that out talents anyone, you know, one through eleven, one through eighteen. Um, so having this type of flexible, reliable player out there, I think, is great for them. The five ten minute thing, by the way, I find interesting because when you watch Vancouver the last few years, it's really hard to get to for some teams, and you see them jump on teams early, and a lot of times it feels like they didn't mean to. Like it just happens because yeah. the team it's comes off a long trip. Thing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're up 1-0 and the crowd's behind them. And it may not be the way they see the game. And it would be interesting to just how Houston tries to use their natural advantages, the way Robin Frazier's already spoken about using Denver and Colorado t- uh, as a natural advantage. You'd like to see that a little bit more from yeah. Vancouver. It feels like Mark Dos Santos is not a guy who's super dogmatic tactically. No. He's no, he likes to it, win. Yeah. He switched it up a lot of different ways. This team right now, and look, it is incomplete. There's only one way to put it with the Vancouver Whitecaps. They were incomplete last year, and they were at the bottom of the Western Conference. They're incomplete now because it's Cavallini and then what? Like Theo Bear? Like mm-hmm. I, I liked. He had some good moments. I think Freddie Mar- Montero is still technically... He's still here, but like, come on, you got Cavallini. Jordy Rain is still there. Play. Jordy Rain is the only, like, Toussaint Ricketts. It just feels like a lot of mismatched parts, especially in the front four. Yeah. And a lot of those parts they brought in last year were so mismatched that they were just immediately gone. They yeah. jettisoned them. And then you have what? It's like, it's in Bohm, it's Tybert, it's Andy Rose. I mean, like, they, they're okay, missing. Daniel Henry's gone. Like, they don't have Ali Adnan's a DP, which. Just taking a moment away from the depression train that you're driving it's us It's not all a depression down. train. It's, it's to say, this is going to be a sit back and counter team. It has to be, does it not? Like, they just don't have talent to do anything else. Sure. And they I have would just some say to do that. Every year that they have built around something, the thing they are building around has been poor. Every time they've brought in a DP striker outside of, like, Kenny Miller. Whoa, 20 wow. years ago or something. Can we get a Barry Robson and one year, in Yeah, here? and Ooh. one year with Pedro Morales. Oh, like that one too. They've all they've all fallen. Wasn't Ardiz whatever? Wasn't yeah. he a Ardaiz. 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 A designated that player was, last year? He, he was not a good yeah. So at least no. now they have something that's a sure thing. Yeah. yeah. And so then you can start to put pieces around that. And whether it's 
you know, a 5-3-2, and Jordi Reyna plays as the second forward off of Cavallini, and the two have a little two-man game up top, and Wang and Bombs hitting balls into the channels for them. And you've got Ali Adnan down one wing because you don't have enough – or you don't have any good center backs. You just throw, like, six out there and see what <laughs> happens. Whatever it is that they end up doing here, at least you can – I don't know, maybe start to see a bit of a blueprint. Yeah, uh, we'll see. The designated it, player it, it, left back is a tough yeah, one to get That around. is a tough one. That is a tough one. Ali or Adnan. they're just forward thinking. Exactly. We shall see because there is more to think about for the Whitecaps. Do have some signings to make. Uh, that new sporting director – he says he was worth the money, Schuster. So now he's got some more signings to make. January 1st will help him make some of those. You would think he would be, or we would speculate that he might be more of the Ernst Tanner type where he has some, as you said in the past, Dave, some uh, some places where he can get an advantage, mm-hmm. scouting networks that other people don't have, players that he's familiar with that he can bring in. We shall see. They do have some holes. But this is a big one for the Vancouver Whitecaps. Lucas Cavallini for reported six million dollars. Uh, let's stand Leo MX and let's talk Roger Martinez and Inter Miami because we haven't done this. I really thought that we had and I was kind of like, I think you know, you, you don't get that excited and about things other than hummus. Yeah. I'm pretty hyped about Roger Martinez. Mm, I get pretty hyped about Colombian attack. Okay, players. fine. <laughs> yeah, this is this could hummus be good. level of soccer for <laughs> what kind of hummus would Roger Martinez be like if you were gonna uh, you know, like what you know, he, he would be a, a nice creamy bowl of hummus with a sliced hard boiled egg in it. The dream. Mm. This is plain. There's no flavoring. Just what do you mean plain? Just this is the flavor. Fine. Okay. Okay. That's good. Yeah, okay. That's a good what point. What are you talking good point, about? Good point. Good point. Sesame seeds. What kind of player could he be? Because he was like a winger mostly, right? At Club America. He's. Uh, oh, what? we shouldn't talk about it in the past tense, man. It's they done? got. They got. No, no, no. We shouldn't talk about Roger yeah, Martinez. He has two more games. He has two more games oh. because Club America is in the Ligia final, twenty sixth and. 30th or 29th? 29th. 26th and 29th against Monterey, who are in the Club World Cup this week. They play Liverpool tomorrow, I think. Yeah, so like we could see Roger Martin. Like He started one of the games in the semifinal, I think. I think he started both in the quarters. He had a banger that got called back in the second leg. Yeah. And he's like, which we'll get to, that's Roger Martinez. And he had a fantastic goal for Argentina this summer in in the Club of America. Uh, Yeah, against Argentina, rather. Um, We're all in offseason. I was going to say that. <laughs> Hummus talks got you thrown. Yeah, man. a little bit. Yeah. Um, it, it, I when I watch Roger Martinez, I I see a guy who is often played on the wing, and I understand why because he's fast and he's reliable on the ball, and he puts in a good effort. But I think he's a center forward. I I, I honestly do. I think like this might be a Joseph Martinez type of thing. Like Joseph in Syria, they always played him on the wing. He wasn't great on the wing. He comes to MLS, he plays for Tata, and he's scoring 30 goals a year. Now, I'm not saying that if Roger Martinez signs in MLS, signs with Miami, that he'll be a 30-goal scorer, but I think it's a, a similar type of scenario where, yeah. where he's like – And gets a full-time job where yeah. he's like, oh, even when he's played well at center forward for America, he's gotten moved out Yeah, because there's a lot of players there. There's a lot of options, and there's been – I I don't know the deeper part of – there's been something about him where the fans just don't really like him. Yeah. And so he's never had that behind him where it's like, well, we're going to keep giving him a shot. And I don't know if it's because Uribe, Uribe was sort of aging out and it felt like he was the replacement and that was a fan favorite, whatever it was. I agree with you that he's a, he's a number nine. He's also bigger than Joseph Martinez, so he can hang at that position in Major League Soccer. He can bang with center backs. He's a physical guy. He can take that space. He's – Uber, he, he's incredibly fast, but he scores wonder goals. Like he scores wild. I mean, the goal against Argentina, yeah. he comes off the wing and just rips one into a corner, and it's like, oh yeah, Argentina's about to lose to Colombia for yeah. the first time in like twenty five <laughs> years because, and he's still only twenty five. Yep. Twenty five. Yep. Yeah. He'll be twenty six. Uh, 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 yeah, very uh, soon. Uh, yeah, At uh, some point, they bought him for about six million a couple of years ago. Um, the reported, the rumors that we've seen would be him moving. To MLS for around six million. Which, looking at the prices that we have seen recently, if if it's like That'd he is surprising. more accomplished than than, some than Lucas Cavallini, for instance, yeah. who just for six million, according to Jeff Crowler. By the way, some reporting. We just have to give the shout the out to Paul thing, Tenorio on this. He's the one that reported it. Yeah, and the other thing is that um, his his contract is supposedly very large, so maybe uh, Club America just want to get that off the books, so they'd be willing to sell. Not also, the foreigner all. rule is coming in. That's true for Liga MX. So there are things. Um, he would make a lot of sense in MLS. It would make a lot of sense in that market, getting a Colombian national team guy in Miami. That said, Miami have already spent a lot of money on Julian Carranza, 19-year-old Argentinian youth international, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, and he's a center forward. He doesn't play any other position. So are you going to 
buy a 25 year old DP for a lot of money uh, to play him ahead of your soon to be 20 year old Tam center forward? Like I, I'm just. We know you Miami's going to have a starter today. He's not in Argentina right now. Yeah, well, I think part of that is like, okay, you're going to another team. We're not going to invest. Fair. We've already sold yeah. you. Yeah, that's fair. So I, I think like I, it's a, it would have been a lot of money to spend on Carranza if he's not going to come. Yeah. Like, because if Martin if Martinez comes in too, Carranza actually doesn't is have it, a fair chance to could, win that. Could I just throw out an example of Brian Rodriguez as well? That would kind of fit in the same mold. We're like, well, you have Diego Rossi, and like you might sell him, but you might not. And you have Carlos Vela, who won't be moved. And in this era of MLS, maybe you aren't thinking so linearly in terms of like, this is our guy here. This is our investment. The people behind him it has to kind of fall in place as far as a hierarchy yeah, goes. It's Except different. LAFC is the best team in the league already, and they are going to sell. And they are going to sell Diego Rossi. Right? Sure. Okay. Well, it's like a ninety percent. Although chance. Roger Martinez does have sell-on value at his age. But the other thing that I think on top of this is we've been promised they have to sign a huge, big-name European DP to get people to do. come to the games. We've Everyone said it for two years on this show. Every I, single rumor has been I don't think we've said they Luis to, Suarez. Would, all the things with Miami Cavani. that you hear are that they, it sh- they should because of the I sports th- town that Miami is. I'm throwing up the air quotes there. I have no I idea. Think the, I've I literally think, never even been I think to Miami. The Miami. I think the Miami or the, the Atlanta approach would work in Miami. Where, where you're like, we have a well-known, you know, internationally known Latin American manager. We have these young, exciting uh, Latin American stars come be part of this cool experience, you know, w- with the new soccer team in town. I, I absolutely think that would work better in Miami than, like, let's find a 34-year-old from the EPL. You mean David Silva? Who I had forgotten about until then. Who he's knows 32. if that's going to happen? He's 32. He will be 34. David Silva is still it's, Yeah, He will be 34, so though. so good. But, yeah. <laughs> he would be I'm, an I'm awesome I'm down for that, signing. too. But look, maybe Mateus Pellegrini is that guy. You maybe. Get, maybe, he's the, he, maybe he's your Almiron type. I'm not saying he's going to be sold for 25, whatever it was, million. Yeah. But maybe he's the one that you build up and you have different sort of like, you know, pokers in the fire. You've got a Columbia International that's 25 who just scored a goal at Copa America that everybody is obsessed with and has played in the next by the way he's also played in china so roger martinez has chased the coin a little bit no offense i, I mean i would yeah, do the same the like, bag, yeah for sure um uh, we'll see we'll see if paul's reporting it that means it definitely has legs and by the way another paul did build atlanta united or help build it that's paul mcdonough he is the sporting director at inter miami as well let's run through some news if you have thoughts on any of this just jump in and give them uh new u.s open cup format let's go it's MLS exciting. teams entering the round of 64. We have been not all of them, not all of them. Yeah, like half of them. Yeah, which is even better right. actually, yeah. because then you have a okay. bunch of teams that get to play MLS teams in that round for the first time and in the next round. Yeah, and hopefully you're sending them on the road. I know that's not part of the official release there, but uh, like I've I ranted about this. Like send them on the road. Make this competition don't, different. Yeah, don't, don't make it another. Don't sell. I disagree. Don't automatically send them yeah, on the road. Just do the coin flip. Mm. But what's nice about the, coin the, the way it's been set up is you now also have more time in between rounds. So you right. have more times to either sell tickets if you're the home team for a big game like that, or it should be cheaper to schedule travel for away teams. So now it's been spaced out rather than last year, where I think there was three rounds in three straight weeks. Yeah, it was bang, bang, bang. Uh, the rest of them will enter in round of 32 and onward and upward. The one problem about this is there's a large section of the U.S. Open Cup teams that are NPSL and PDL, yeah. and they use college players, and college players normally aren't released by this time of the year. And I did a game last year with a PDL team where they basically just ran high school kids out there. Actually, I did multiple games. And they, you know, I was on the phone with coaches and they were like, we don't know if this guy's going to show up. We don't know who's here. Like, we've got 16 players right now. We're in a hotel waiting to see what happens. Um, And one team kind of like, had a bunch of Ivy League guys, so they show up like in July or something because they have the classes that go the latest. So it that throws things off a little bit in the early rounds. All right, we'll see how that uh, works out there. Of course, Bruce Arena talking at a different – speaking of college soccer, mm-hmm. by the way, Georgetown, congratulations to them. Champions. To specific congratulations uh, to one of the great institutions yeah. in college sports. Georgetown Hoyas. Sure. Way, way to go, Hoyas. Yeah. Are you a Georgetown fan? No, yeah, big, uh, I just want to just trying to just trying to stir a little <laughs> yeah. Big East. I, just, I, I will say this: I, I, I like clip that out. You know, you're not Big East, or you haven't been. Oh, okay, so, you saw the tweet. You yeah, know, I yeah. like I do like the way Georgetown plays. They try to play real soccer. They're one of the 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 college teams that does that every year. Um, Sean Nealis, their right back, he'll go really high. Dylan. Sean's on. Sean's already. Yeah, Dylan Nealis, the right back, he'll he'll go really high in the. Uh, 
in, in the draft this year. Um, I think I really liked their center forward, Dodson, a uh, kid from Chicago, I think Soccer's Academy, um, or Magic, one of those two. Yeah. I, I got to say, this was, I, this was not a prompt to talk about and then, Georgetown And then soccer. Will Sands. James like, Sands is uh, oh, a cool. twin brother. Part, okay, I'm here for that part. Yeah, so, and he, his twin brother. Yeah, his twin brother. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. Plays as a left winger. I think he's probably going to end up being a fullback. He, he was pretty impressive as well. Oh, that's cool. Do you like my guy Achara? Uh, you got to speak into the microphone there. I did speak into the microphone. Mm. Who? Achara? Oh, yeah, he was good, but he's hurt all the time. Yeah, all the time. And he's like 25. Anyway, this Soccer, was supposed to be Bruce Arena was there, and he let drop to Stephen Goff, the Washington Post, that they will be signing the Revs, a designated player, a forward. And then Sam Stajko of The Athletic came out and said it's Adam Buksa, a 23-year-old Polish center forward who, you know, mixed bag as far as his goal-scoring record. It was one every two games last year, and it's a little less than that this With year. last year? I have no idea. I, I just wanted to hear you yeah, try and say no, it. Let's see if I can. Pogon Sisesnian. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, I feel I like it sounds good. I think it's, right. it's Szeszyn, right? Because S-Z-C-Z in Polish is Shej. You doing some Duolingo on that side too? Uh, I, I do. I, I'm a quarter Polish. So uh, I, anyway, 23 year old, Grammy he's Tommy. tall and he's big and hopefully it's Casper Shabilko if you're the Revs, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't know if we have any other thoughts on that one. Go check out Sam's reporting on it. The thoughts are they have great, atta- great creative players. Correct. Pania, Heel, Bo, who's really more of a second forward you would think. So maybe whoever be goes good. in front of them doesn't have to be a stud. Teal Bunbury can play the wing. Yeah, but you just need someone to do the job to allow those guys to be at yeah. their best. Uh, what did you say? What date did you say that Rod Fanny was going to sign? <laughs> for yeah, I thought it would be next summer yeah, as an emergency. Nah, it's, as it turned out, December 16th. So Rod Fanny is back, and uh, Nacho Piatti reportedly wants to go back to Argentina. So it's December in yeah. Montreal. Uh, we'll see if he gets back to San Lorenzo. They did exercise his option, which was like $6 million, I believe. So it's going to be a good deal for him no matter what. Maybe his family's a little more happy in Argentina. Maybe his bank account's really happy here. Kamar Lawrence wants a trade. Because he wanted a new deal, and the Red Bulls reportedly would not entertain that. He's not afraid to say it. He sort of just signed a new deal in 2018. Yeah, but then he saw other people sign new deals, yeah. and he looked at his money, and he was like, Twice as much. Yeah, and he was like, my money doesn't look as good anymore, and I'm still probably arguably the best left back in the league. And Red Bulls were like, you probably should have thought of that when you signed a new deal just now. He probably did, and they probably said that's too much based on market value. I don't know. I'm just making yeah, things yeah, up yeah, there. But yeah, we'll see what happens. It's not easy right now. Also, the club has no forward momentum. They haven't signed anyone. It doesn't feel like there's – a North Star that they're pointed at like they have been over the last six years. And I think you saw that in his comments of just, if he's not, he also wants to win a title. And right. He doesn't feel like he's working towards either of those. Now, maybe it'll look different in March after the Red Bulls offseason and what they choose to do and blah, blah, blah. But right now, a guy who's been there for a while, it doesn't seem like he feels that way. Yeah, I mean, and you can understand that in some ways. When you see mostly USL signings coming through, and you know Kaku was a big one, but outside of that, a couple it, of years ago, yeah, now. it's been a little, it's been a little time. Uh, let's just run through some quick rumors, and then we'll get to the mailbag, and then on to Sasha question. These are all straight out of South America, and I have a little bit of a sort of my gut telling me, man, this is a different MLS, different transfer window feels, different profile of players, certainly different dollar amounts. Report here, LAFC trying to pick up a Uruguayan youth international from Montevideo Wanderers, Francisco Ginela. He's uh, basically, you would think, a replacement for Atuesta. You sell Atuesta, this guy comes in. The report is 75% of his rights would be $2.5 million. U20 World Cup, now with U23s. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Another Paraguay, or excuse me, then we go to some Paraguayans. 19-year-old at Libertad. He's their number 10. Ivan Franco. Franco. Yes, he has hair like Bob Ross. It's it's absolutely incredible. <laughs> and he's got 18 goals in like 50, 60 games for this club, which are among the big three mm-hmm. in Paraguay the last couple of years. Cerro Porteño, Olympia, and I think generally Libertad are those clubs. They He's linked with unnamed MLS club here. Also was linked with PSG. And then Cecilio Dominguez linked again from Independiente, $6 million. He also has interest in Liga MX, so you, you like kind of wonder if this is an agent play, but they it feels different. all agent play. Like, like Dominguez, he's, not happy. he's not happy in Argentina. Yeah, and they're That's not happy says. with him. Yeah. So, I mean, they like America sold him back in 
January, I believe it was, and now maybe going back. I don't know. It's it's always bizarre with him um, and and Derlis Gonzalez. Like the, there's that generation of like really talented Paraguayan attackers who, for one reason or another, Oscar Romero, another one, who they just like haven't panned out wherever yeah. they've gone. What do you think? Do you have any thoughts on these? Mm, Anything specific? Uh, no, nothing specific. More general. That it's exciting when you see players at this quality, and I think. It shows Major League Soccer where it stands in the world game now, which is different than what it used to be. Uh, none of these would have been realistic, so it would have been unnecessary. Even if they're just agent plays of just trying to get names out there, it would have been just Liga MX teams. It would have just been like, oh, they have offers from Mexico because that's where the money is, yeah. and that's where you can go. Now it's legitimate, not just that Major League Soccer will spend the money, but that it's the right pathway for a lot of these players' careers, so it makes sense for people to say, oh, yeah, young, international, South American international. You go to MLS, then yep. you go to Europe. Hey, go be Diego Whatever Rossi. it is. Yeah, and so that now has changed, I think, a lot of the equation for these things. And if four or five years ago, we would have jumped through a window if we yeah. saw anything and like And look, this. MLS has been making moves like this. Aranguiz, you think of Christian Coleman, Josue Coleman. There's, you could run through a lot of these players. It's risk-reward. Luis Diaz just Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. but you know, some work, some don't, and we'll see what happens with these. Quickly to the mailbag, because Anders is saying uh, I've wasted a lot of our time here. Just some news. Commissioner Don Garber is going to Charlotte on Tuesday for ah, some announcement. We don't know what it could be. What might oh, it be? No idea. idea. Who knows? Maybe he's just still driving back from right. College Cup. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it's a maybe Road trip. He forgot something. From Cary, North Carolina. Right. Yeah. right. So we'll see what that is. I don't is. know where Cary is. We did our right. awards. Northeast of Charlotte. Tim Finnegan says we missed Uon for fullback of the year. No. I no. knew he's that, that really, would He's come really up. good, but he's, come on, guys. No. Okay, no. Evan here from Dallas. Epic award show. I think I cried from laughing at one point. That's what we're going for. One suggestion for next year, you need to have all the extra time hosts on to do it. He says he missed Susanna and Kalen. And here's last but not least, this is a legendary mail from the YouTube section from the legend RVH. He came up with the top hangout scenario for each member of extra time. And uh, we'll get to Bobby in a second, obviously, but we had to run through this for uh, – I'll go for you, Dave, first. Oh. Your ideal friend hangout situation, you as a friend, whoever, fill in the blank with you, would be a road trip or foreign vacation. RVH says he wants a guy with an engine to keep things exciting and push comfort zones. Dave loves finding the hidden gems. He's a bottomless pit for food, so he's always throwing down. He's social, makes friends easily, so that helps open doors. I'm guessing he's a clutch. He's clutching a pinch, which is absolutely necessary when things get sketchy. Greater than zero chance we'd end up in jail, though. If I made a travel partner in a lab, he would basically be David Goss. I think that nails it, actually. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And a lot of these really nailed it. Here's yeah. yours, Doyle. Your dungeon master. Uh, he says he's never played D&D, but he could see Doyle throwing himself into it hard and making it legitimately fun. You have a good sense of humor. You like to make stories, bust chops, and get drunker as the night wears on. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yep. so that one I think was pretty accurate. You guys can judge mine here. He has three, I guess, for me, and they're all wow. very Midwestern. Helping to move out. Uh, RVH says Weeby would be focused and put the most honest hours in. So true. He's a Midwestern guy. I am. And that helps. He is uh, slim pickings for this crew and moving out. Mm. I don't think any of you helped me move out. but uh, You didn't help me move out either, and yeah, I would I gave not you a, trust you. But I gave you a free umbrella. I literally helped Fershaw move in when he moved to Berkeley. Oh. Yeah. So, okay, so you got yeah. some cred here. Yeah. But he only does it if the, if the weather is nice. That's, oh, so for 100% sure. Yeah, right, right. If it's like raining, yeah, it's a little yeah, bit yeah. cold. New York's a little too hot. Story, yeah. sure. If you move between May 5th and May 31st and it's nice enough. And it's an elevator building. Doyle yeah. will be there. <laughs> uh, baby play dates. Yep. I would be responsible. Pay attention. I wouldn't bring my kid over sick. True. Wouldn't talk too much or too little. Very important. And dorm roommate. Again, it's about balance. Says I could chill in the dorm or go out. I wouldn't be too loud. And I wouldn't kick you out when you brought a. Okay. And it right there. Yeah, I think, I think the fits. baby play dates one is probably your strong. Yeah, for I think sure. Actually, all yeah. of these are at different points in my life. You know, back in the day when your friends are moving all the time, I was great at moving. You when would one hundred percent show up late to someone moving. False. A hundred percent. 
Yeah, oh, come on. I would 100%. put money on Weeby, that. And on. you would show up and like a bunch would be done and you'd be like, oh, you know that thing when that one friend shows up late, but it's already kind of done. Classic. <laughs> no, no. Uh, let's see. We have a Bobby Warshaw one here, but we'll end with really? that one, obviously. Uh, Susanna, game night, enthusiastic, emotive, low-key, super competitive. Yeah, wouldn't mm-hmm. make things awkward. She has great interpersonal skills. Nailed that one. Brings the good food and wine. Yeah, yeah. And if you forget to bring something, Suze has you covered. So, uh, Kim. She also has a ton of skills. Yeah, she if does. If you're doing like acting things out mm-hmm. type yep. stuff, she yep. would be most useful. She's probably the best drawer of anyone here, and I've never seen any of us draw. Uh, dr- oh. Sketcher? Uh, okay. Artist? Drawer. I was drawer. like, drawer. Was drawer. Like, what? what? Drawer. what? Uh, For a lot of deal. Kaylin, music festival, knows all the bands coming through. Quote, I know the guitarist, good guy. Let's go backstage and check him out. End quote. Good chance he will disappear and you will never see him for the rest of the night, though. Yeah. yeah, that sounds uh-huh. right. Yeah. I don't know about the music festival part, but, but I like do any know sort of about the... artistic cultural yes. thing. Like you, five minutes with Kalen at the start, and then right, and then you like Guys, meet it's... somebody cool through him, and yeah. then you never see him again. It's funny because I went to Governor's Ball one time and ran into Kalen in the VIP section. Really? Yep. What were you doing in the VIP section? I know people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. I've got connections. Charlie uh, clubbing. Yeah. He's oh. a relaxed alpha who can cut through the crowd. Yeah. He knows the perfect. <laughs> he sets his friends up. No, stays in his lane. Yeah. It's you know he can salsa. I don't know if he can, but that sounds like Charlie. And we'll end here and then explain the Bobby thing uh, if if we have time. Anders, let me know. Uh, Bobby book club. He is thoughtful and takes unexpected angles. Facts. Yeah. One minute he is coming with a great point. The next is like, what book did this guy read? And then he closes by. Mixing up with the host, he's a total wild card, and the only good thing about this boring book club is his. This is his. Sorry, I yeah, I yeah, just you read be, that verbatim. It, yeah, yeah, this is his domain. <laughs> yeah. uh, being in a book club with Bobby sounds like hell. Yeah. <laughs> That just sounds like my own personal nightmare. Yeah, well, yeah. I think we've done that for basically two Anders years at this saying, point. Anders is saying we gotta... When the dream becomes reality, go read it. And yeah. Anders, come on. Well, Okay, Thursday, you guys will be here. You'll explain the we'll Bobby thing. It. Yeah, Perfect. we got it. All right. Sasha question coming up. Triple D on Thursday. I'm out for 2019. It's been a pleasure, everyone. We will see you on the other side. It's time again for MLS Story Time here on Extra Time, driven by Kano. We have a special guest in the room, Sasha Kleschen. You know him from Seton Hall, let's say. Chivas USA, Anderlecht, back to the New York Red Bulls, Orlando City, and uh, as we or you are listening to this, that may have changed because Sasha is in a quote-unquote free agent year as well. Sasha, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, man. So here's what we do on these. I basically just get guys I'm interested in and just try to pick your brain about anything and everything in your career. And with you, I want to start sort of from the beginning, and I'm not talking professional. I'm talking the first time you saw a ball because I have a two-year-old. I know you have children. I heard the Benny and Sal podcast interview, and you guys are cracking up about Sal Zizzo and, uh, and Benny and, and Mike Grella and how they're sort of raising their kids in soccer. And I wonder how you were raised in this game from the beginning and on. Yeah, I guess just talking about my son real quick. He's two and a half, and uh, you know I just toss him volleys like all day, and he just smacks them with his left foot. And I'm sure my dad was doing the same thing. So my mom always says that basically from when I was born, there was a ball in my crib. Uh, my dad was a big soccer player growing up and a big soccer fan. So uh, I played with him a lot around the house. I remember playing AYSO when I started when I was about four or five years old, and I was just obsessed with the sport. And then I think the thing that put it over the top for me was the 94 World Cup. I think I must have been uh, nine years old that summer, you know, watching the final in L.A. at the Rose Bowl, everything that kind of really just caught on. And from that moment forward, I I only had one goal in life, and that was to be a professional soccer player. So then it was just playing every day after that, trying to make my, my, uh, my goal and my dream a reality. You were nine. I was a little younger. You were in L.A. Did you go to any games? Did you have that opportunity? I did not. Uh, my dad used to take us to a lot of uh, L.A. Galaxy games growing up, so that happened a few years later. And then whenever the national team would play in L.A., like at the Rose Bowl, we would go to those games, but I don't think we went to any World Cup games. Probably too expensive for us or something. you got to be uh, pretty proud of the lefty that you're raising, huh? Yeah, so my, o- my older brother Gordon is a lefty, and... He had like the nicest left foot of anybody I've played with, literally like maybe in my career. So uh, he's got a good uncle to look up to, my little boy Knox, to to practice the left foot as the years go on. So what do you remember about the way your dad sort of shaped you or talked to you about the game or included you? I, I think of 
uh, some stories I've heard where you were playing up. We always talk, oh, the, you know, you got to play up levels. You got to be with quote unquote men. Your dad was an active player. And I've heard stories about you as a kid playing in those games and just getting kicked, yeah. having to work through it. What were those like? Where were those games? Who was playing? Yeah, we used to go to this Serbian church in, uh, I think it's San Gabriel, a uh, uh, town of Los Angeles. You know, so it was about an hour north of where we lived. And uh, we didn't go to the church to go to church. We went to the church to play soccer. So right behind the church, there was this little field, and it was about the perfect size for a 6v6. And so my dad would put together a team of basically me, my brother, and our other like talented friends from Southern California, and we would go play against the men. And so the men were all these like Serbian ex-professional players who now lived in LA. They were probably in their late forties or fifties and like, yeah, they would kick the shit out of us. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I was probably, you know, 12, 13, 14, I started getting really good. And you know, then they started kicking me a little bit harder and no, I, nobody wanted to lose. And so, those were fun, but they were actual battles, and they were good for me, I think, as a player. And I learned a lot playing against guys that were much bigger and stronger than me. How did you know you were good? When did you know? And how did that change your sort of mindset toward the sport? You said at nine, I want to be a pro. And yeah. you know, a lot of nine-year-old kids want to be pros. Not many go yeah. on to be pros. Yeah, I don't know. I had something inside me ever since since that time. But I, even when I was four or five and I played AYSO, I, I felt like the game came easy to me. I just understood it. I don't know. My dad always pushed me to to work really hard and, and and go after what I wanted to do. He he came to the states and uh, you know made a really nice life for himself. And you know he left every morning before I was even awake to go to to go to school. He'd come home at seven o'clock at night. Then he'd ask if I wanted to go to the park and practice penalty kicks or free kicks or anything like that. So I think I just looked at him and and got that that hardworking mentality from him. And then, I don't know, after the World Cup in 94, I just felt like I had something special and I wanted to do that. Unfortunately, I never made it to a World Cup, but, but I just kept pushing myself with a lot of training. And, and I also had an older brother who was a great player to look up to and, and play with him and play on some of his teams over the years. You think about your child and what you maybe want from him, whether it's just loving the game or being a pro, it's very early for those things. People like to talk about how we can create the next generation of, honestly, Sasha questions. How do you think parents should think about that when they have young kids who love the game or they're hoping to imprint the game upon them or they're hoping one day that maybe they're able to realize the dreams that they have. Yeah, it's hard. I don't want to push soccer onto my son. I want him, if he likes the sport, to play it. If he, I want him to do whatever he wants to do with his life and I'll be supportive. So, you know, my dad really pushed soccer and then, you know, fortunately, you know, my brother and I are still involved in the game and we, we love it very much. He works for the LA Galaxy and, and I'm a player still. So, I think he's got to be proud of that because he loved the sport so much and we still work in the sport. But, you know, I'm not going to push it on my son to, to play the game or, or do whatever he wants to do. If he wants to play, I'm going to support him and I'll push him as much as I can. But my wife and I always joke around and I've always thought about in my career path that I went to college and then I played in MLS and then I eventually went to Europe. And so maybe I was a little bit behind by the time I got to Europe, some of the 18 year olds or so that were at Anderlecht that were coming up through the academy and they had been basically groomed to be a full-time pro you know I was at college when I was 18 playing in a two three month season and I don't regret it at all because I loved college and that was the best time of my life but I also think about my son if he did become a serious player and he got to be 15 16 17 and was really good would I would I want to push him to maybe move to Europe and get into an academy there or if he could sign a first team deal or, or what the path would be like or if I would push him to go to college or stay in the States? I don't know. Uh, it's interesting and it's interesting to think about how soccer could change over the next 15 years, especially here at home. But, you know, I, I loved my path and I enjoyed every minute of it. How is it different now as you're in, a, in clubs and you see at the Red Bulls, especially guys graduate through that pathway at a younger age versus where you were. Take me back to you being 15 or 16. You wanted to be a pro. How did you see that path? How did you think, okay, I can, you know, I can accomplish this in this way? I think the, the, the route that I went was that uh, I had to go to college and I had to prove myself. And, and then my dream was to be called by the under 20 national team, which I, I was after my freshman year at Seton Hall. And then I thought, okay, if I can keep pushing this, then I could get a Generation Adidas contract and leave school early because that was my goal. And at that time, the most money you could make as a young guy in MLS was if you had a Generation Adidas contract. If you came out after your senior year, you were most likely getting the minimum deal. And so 
that was my path. And, and that was what I pushed for as hard as I could. And you know, I thought about leaving after my sophomore year, but the offer from the league was not uh, good enough financially, I think. So I did one more season at Seton Hall. And after my junior year, I left. And that was the path for me back then. The path is much different now, I think. Uh, I look at the academy teams and, and, you know, my brother's at the Galaxy. And so I, I train there in the off season. Then I see the academy kids who go to high school now at StubHub Center, Dignity Sports Health Park, whatever it's called now. And, you know, they, they're they in a professional environment. They train with each other. Some of them live with each other. Uh, they go to school together. It's 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 maybe a little bit different for them socially, but the opportunities that they have are 10 times greater than the opportunities I had. Take me back to draft day, leading up to it. Yeah, draft. You go to Chivas USA, rest in peace. There were good times. There were bad times for Chivas. Yeah. Uh, fortunately I was there for all the good times. Um, yeah, I mean, I was there for four and a half years. I, I made the playoffs the first four seasons and then I left halfway through that fifth year, but draft day was crazy. So I didn't play at the combine because I did not want to get drafted in the top four. And I was really hoping to get drafted number five by then the New York, New Jersey Metro stars. So I'd been going to Seton Hall. They had the number five pick. I met with them before the draft. They promised me that they'd pick me at number five if I were still available. And I was ecstatic because I loved New Jersey and I wanted to stay there at that time. Uh, and then right as the draft happened, uh, right before the first pick, the Metro Stars traded the first pick. Oh no, Chivas had the first pick. They traded the first pick to the Metro Stars for the fifth pick and a player to be named later. So then I got through the next uh, three picks after that and Chivas picked me and I was very happy, you know, um, Bob had been the coach of the Metro Stars the season before. I had trained with Bob a little bit at the Metro Stars while I was still in college, so I had gotten to know him a little bit. And then I was just excited for a chance, and then it got to mean that I was moving home also. So, uh, And then stop it all off, I walked off stage from the draft, and Bob was like, we traded for Jay Hernandez, who had been the guy who hosted me on my college trip to Seton Hall, a guy I was still living with at the time while he was a rookie at the Metro Stars. So I, it couldn't have worked out perfectly. And then, then I get into preseason with Chivas, um, and it's a rebuilding team, so which is perfect for a young guy to come in and play. And, and then I got super lucky during preseason that Ramon Ramirez, you know, Mexican legend, I think he was 37 at the time, I think he tore his ACL in preseason, and he missed the whole year. So I slotted into his spot next to Jesse Marsh in midfield, and, and, and I played every game my rookie year, which is all you can ask for as a rookie, and I guess the rest is history. A couple of names there that have a big influence on your career going forward. It's both Bob and it's Jesse in a couple different ways. Jesse is a player and then a coach, and Bob is a coach, including with the national team. When you got into that team and you started to play under Bob and, and see who Bob was and what he was about, help us understand Bob at that time. Because he has evolved, but he's always been Bob. Yeah, he's always been very demanding, which is something that I love uh, out of coaches and something that I've always thrived under. Uh, he helped me a lot, you know, talking about body positioning and setting myself up and being harder to play against and making plays in tight areas, all the stuff that he still preaches today when I see LAFC play and how good that their midfield is. That was the idea back then. And so Bob just pushed me and pushed me and and I loved every minute of it. It, it was It was awesome. And then the team had so many older guys that were you know, good guys, good leaders, good mentors for me, really good players to look up to. So, you know, I had Claudio Suarez and Paco Palencia and Jesse Marsh and Ante Razov, and those were probably the main guys I learned a lot from in my first few years as a pro. One of my favorite Jesse Marsh moments is the uh, Beckham moment. I, I would love to hear your perspective on that moment. And if people at home haven't seen that one, they got into a little scrap and Jesse, Jesse was about it, which should yeah. surprise no one. No, so... I had watched Jesse a lot growing up and uh, getting to be his teammate. You know, he's not a big guy and, and Beckham's not a big guy either. So it was these two little skinny dudes just kicking each other and then getting each other's face. And, you know, their lips were so close. They were about to kiss and nobody was really going to do anything. But Jesse looked like a beast in that moment. I think he loved that moment secretly. Oh, not secretly. I think it's probably more publicly that he loved that moment. What was it like to have that dichotomy, though? You're in you're in the same training facilities as the Galaxy you know, it's Chivas and you guys were successful, but there still is this feeling of like fancied and unfancied. What did that do to sort of the relationships between the two teams as you see each other, but also the way you guys viewed yourselves? Yeah, it was a little bit weird because, you know, our locker rooms were, you know, they weren't that close to each other, but we shared the gym. And so there were moments where, okay, we had the gym from noon to one and then from one 
on they were coming in and so it was like you know we would cross over with a few guys and everybody was friendly with each other and I had friends on the team that I had played with maybe on the under 20s and stuff like that so everybody kind of got to know each other and and most of us players all lived in the South Bay area too in LA and so we saw each other out all the time and we were friendly but those games that we played against each other they, they felt like a bloodbath but other than that everybody seemed to be cool and and it was it was a little bit bizarre um and that first year, I mean, my whole time there, pretty much we were better than them at that moment. They were in a really down period, I think, of their club. Um, but that first year, we just couldn't beat them. And, and then after that, I think the second season, we finally beat them. I think we beat them twice, 3-0 in the second season. And that was like a really good feeling because we always felt, I think, like the little brother in the stadium. We were renting the stadium. They were the, you know, the biggest club in MLS and all that. So some really good games over the years. A lot of my favorite memories as a Chivas player were games against the Galaxy. Tell me about as you progress and you become a star in this league in many ways, and I still remember the, the sort of iconic like curling shot cutting in that you would have. That was Those days were the original sort of I got turned onto the league and was like, oh my God, what is this? And then I remember the interest and is Sasha Question going to go? Is he going to go to Europe? What's going to happen with him? What was the progression like? You know, maybe even from the first sort of inklings of, oh, this, this might happen all the way to the actual move to Anderlecht. Yeah, so I think the interest all probably started around my third season, which was 2008. I, I think, yeah, I think after my second season, I had a good year. Then I go, I remember going into 2008, you know, Robbie Rogers is from Huntington Beach also. And so we spent that whole off season training together. Um, it was so funny because he, he's an early morning riser. So this is going to be a little bit of a long story. But go for it. He's an early morning riser and he would come over to my house and our front door was always unlocked and he would just walk right in and come up to my bedroom and like wake me up like five days a week and just be like, come on, let's go train. Come on, let's go work out. And I'd be like, dude, it's eight o'clock and it's the off season. Like, let me sleep for another couple hours. But anyway, we would go and we'd play like one-on-one -on -one soccer tennis and we would do fitness and we would do finishing drills. And we told each other that year, like, this is our year. Like, the Olympics are coming up. We've got to play in the Olympics. We've got to both be best 11 this year, and then we're both going to move to Europe. And we ended up both having really amazing seasons, 2008, playing in the Olympics. We both ended up being best 11. Uh, I think they won the championship that year, you know, at, at the StubHub Center in L.A. or Home Depot Center, whatever it was called back then. So really just like an awesome year for us, and then that's when all the interest started to come. Um, at that same time, there were a couple of big teams in Mexico that were interested in me. I think it was Santos and Pachuca. And at that moment, I just wasn't interested in going to Mexico at all. I just had my sights set on Europe. Um, looking back, I love all my time in Europe, but playing in Mexico would have been something very cool, I think, that I would have really enjoyed just growing up in Southern California. But anyway, I think in 2009, at the last game of the season... There was a playoff game against Salt Lake, and there was an agent from Belgium who had moved to L.A. to take a year off from working. He took his family to L.A. He lived in L.A., and he would come watch Galaxy and Chivas games basically in his free time. And he watched me play a bunch all season. And at the last game of the season, he called the vice president and the general manager from Anderlecht and said, you got to come to L.A. you got to watch this kid play. So I played against Salt Lake. I scored in the playoff game. Uh, unfortunately, we lost and we were knocked out. But, you know, he called my dad. He got in touch with him somehow. And the next day, we went to the Beverly Hills Hotel and sat down and met with the, the GM and the vice president of Anderlecht. And they were like, we want to buy you. We want to bring you over. The max we've ever paid for a player in a transfer fee is about 3 million euros. So that's the max we can offer. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I can't see Chivas not taking that. Yeah. I'm a young guy. They're not paying me that much. And I want to go to Europe. They said they'll help me. So... They made the offer. I think Chivas came back asking for like five million or something like that, and it just didn't work out. And so, the start of the two thousand, maybe ten season, I, I was like very disappointed that this didn't work out. And I remember that was a really down period of my career. Uh, but whatever. Fast forward to two thousand ten, middle of two thousand ten, I get. I go to the World Cup camp um, before the 2010 World Cup. We're training in Princeton, New Jersey, and and you know right before the team leaves, I was one of the I was one of the last guys that was let off the uh, off the roster, so I didn't go to the World Cup, and I was bummed out. And probably probably four or five days later, and my agent called me and was you know like Anderlecht is still interested, 
And now that you're six months out of contract, they want to buy you now because they think you can get you much cheaper. And so I was like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so open. And we worked out the deal super fast. And I signed with Anderlecht probably three weeks later, got on a flight, moved over there. My girlfriend came soon after, and, and then the rest is history. We know you had a great career there. I, I do want to dig in real quick to that moment in 2010. Because uh, there is the connection with Bob there, and this is the first professional coach for you, someone who really shaped you, and then you have the dream. And I kind of heard the little tinge in your voice early on of like the regret of, oh, God, I just didn't quite make it to the World Cup. Yeah. What was that like? That was probably the hardest moment of my career. Um, Jesse Marsh was also an assistant coach yep. on that team. And um, I had kind of been in and out of the national team in, in maybe late 2009, early 2010. Bob brought me back in. I think there was a friendly game in February. I scored a good goal against El Salvador in like the 90th minute to win the game. So, you know, I put myself back into contention. That was for sure. And I met with Jesse before the World Cup camp started. And he just said, listen, give everything you can. You, you, can, only, you can only do as much as you can do. And in the end, the, the choice is going to be out of your hands. It's going to be Bob's choice. And whether he brings you or not, just know in your heart that you gave everything in training. And so I did that and I worked super hard. And in the end, I didn't make it and it sucked. That was the hardest part of my career for sure. But fortunately, like I said, like one door closed and another door opened. But yeah, that sucked. And I got to talk to Bob after we played LAFC uh, last season in LA. And I just, you know, I thanked him for everything he's done for me in my career. And he hugged me right away and said like, you know, I know missing the World Cup was like really hard for you, but you bounced back like immediately. Cause the next camp after the World Cup, he brought me back in. And I was in with the national team with Bob basically until he got fired. So I feel like I responded really well to that moment, which I've done for my entire career. How does, how did he tell you? I mean, those, that's the moment I have to imagine that's almost like slow motion. We hear all about Jurgen and 2014 and Landon, but I'm always curious about that sort of moment. Like, did you know? Was there a, a meeting called? Was it like everybody was starting to, the group was starting to get kind of cold and it was like, oh God, please don't let me get that text. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, we played a friendly that night in Connecticut against the Czech Republic. I started and I think I played 90 minutes with a bunch of other fringe guys that I think, you know, we were all kind of on the bubble and he mm -hmm. was looking for something. And I didn't play great, to be honest. So we got back to the hotel probably around midnight. I think we had a quick meal at the hotel. We went up to our rooms and we were all, you know, I don't even remember who I was with. But there were probably three or four of us in the room and, and we were just talking like, are we going to make it? When's yeah. he going to tell us? What's going to happen? Do, do, do I think I did enough? And then I got a call from the uh, the team manager, and she just said, you know, Bob wants to talk to you downstairs. And I was like, oh, gosh, I, I, I think this is the moment. And so I went down, and I walked in, and the whole coaching staff was in there, and they just kind of shook their heads. And I was just like, oh, fuck, dude. Yeah. And uh, that was it, man. And then you have to move on. That was it. And packed my bags, flew out the next morning. I think I flew to D.C. from there to play against D.C. United. So... The cool thing was my family, I think, had come to that game in Connecticut, so my girlfriend and my parents, and then they flew down to D.C. with me to watch the game against D.C. United, which I think happened to be Andy Nahar's first game like as a rookie. Oh, wow. That's a crazy coincidence. Yeah, and he scored in that game, and I was thinking, who is this, this kid like scoring this diving header? And I, I think that was my last game as a Chivas player because then the deal started to happen with Anderlecht, and I didn't want to play another game and get injured, so... I got to play my last game in D.C., I think, with my family in the stands, with my girlfriend, watched Andy, then, you know, helped bring Andy over yeah. to Anderlecht a couple of years later. So it's pretty crazy how it all went down, but, you know, it is what it is. So you walk in the door at Anderlecht, and we always hear about uh, sort of the culture and the cutthroat nature and the maybe not disrespect but wariness for American players. You walk through the door in Belgium, and, and what? So everybody at the club was very welcoming. Um, the vice president was the one who really wanted to bring me over. Um, so the the board the board was welcoming right away. The players were not so welcoming. I remember my first week of training camp. I showed up. I had one training at the Anderlecht training facility, and then we went over to Holland for like a ten day training camp. And it was hard. It was just, you know, 
nobody knew anything about American soccer. All they knew about really was Gooch because Gooch was playing at Standard Liège, but that was Anderlecht's biggest rival. Yeah. So nobody knew him personally. And then the only other American player they really knew was Alexi Lawless from the 94 World Cup. They're like, who's the redhead guy with the goatee that plays the guitar? And I'm like, um, that's not who you need to know about in American soccer. Like, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of good players. So I really had to prove myself. And uh, that train, uh, the, the training camp was tough. I just remember going back to my room about five or six days in where we had played like a, a 6v6 little tournament and like my guy dribbled past me and scored. And I just remember all my teammates just like yelling at me. And I was just like, damn, these guys are not welcoming at all. It's cutthroat. And I was like, I just got to prove myself. I'm like, as soon as they see that I'm like a starting caliber player and that I'm going to make a difference in the team, like then they're going to respect me. And, and it took me a while. It took me like two months to really break into the team and, and, and kind of earn the respect of all my teammates and I think the coaching staff as well. And once I finally did, it was the best move of my career. The favorite club I've ever played at in my career really has a special place in my heart. I think maybe Americans and you know other people too, Belgium isn't the biggest league in the world. We don't see it on our TVs every single week. Try to explain what Anderlecht means, what it is, what the ethos, the ethos, the sort of like the culture, the vibe, the heart of the club is. Yeah, so Anderlecht at its core is a family club. It had been owned by the same family for probably 75 years. Uh, he recently sold the club. You know, he's getting a bit older now. His name was Roger Vandenstock, who owned the club while I was there. And a lot of people that work for the club had worked for the club for 30, 40 years. So they were super welcoming to me and my family. But then again, uh, from the outside... Anderlecht is the New York Yankees of Belgium or the Los Angeles Lakers. They're by far the biggest club in the country. They by far have the most fans spread out all over the countries, even though we're from Brussels. Um, so it was a bit different. Everywhere I went, people knew who I was right away. You know, people stopped me and, you know, asking for photos and, and talking about the club and everything and all that. So it, it was a big deal. And there was a lot of pressure because not only were they counted on to win the championship every year, you were counted on to win the championship in style. And so to play good football and to entertain the fans and to win big when you played at home. So the pressure was always there no matter what. And, and, and my first season was a bit difficult. We finished third, I think, which is a failure of a season at Anderlecht. So that was tough coming back in for the second season. And then we won three in a row. So it, it was awesome. It was really the best part of my career. If I remember right, you sort of transitioned a little bit as a player. In MLS, it was very much an attacking player. Uh, could, you know, box to box as well. But you moved back in the field. As a player, how did you evolve there? I think I got better, you know, tactically and a little bit more defensively. We had so many talented players at Anderlecht where at, when I was at Chivas, you know, from about my second or third year on, I was really counted on to make a lot of attacking plays. And I got to Anderlecht and we had so many good attacking players that it was like, all right, well, we need somebody to do a bit of the dirty work. And, and obviously I can run all day and I was covering, you know, 12, 13 kilometers every single game picking up a bunch of 50-50s, winning headers, getting the ball down, you know, giving the ball to the feet of guys like Matias Suarez and Embarak Busufa and Romelu Lukaku who, who were just putting the ball in the back of the net. So, like I said, so many talented guys. We needed somebody to partner with this guy, Lucas Biglia, in the midfield. He's an Argentine who plays at AC Milan now. And him and I just formed this partnership that for three and a half, four years, we played almost every game together in the midfield and, and, and we were we were the best duo in Belgium and we were just making it work and the guys in front of us were getting the job done and it was just winning after winning after winning. It was awesome. How did you feel in that moment after the disappointment, after the tough start, after a tough first season? I mean, I have to imagine like, you know, that's like you're cresting. You're, you're, just, you're just, every day is a good day. Is that how it felt? Yeah, so, you know, winning is always... Winning is always what you play for. But I can remember looking back on like my first season at Chivas and just looking at the end of the season and being like, wow, like I'm just, I'm so thankful that I played every game this season and I got better. So my first season at Anderlecht was like that too. I remember in the off season just being like, all right, I played like 75% of the games now, but I'm going to go back this season and really establish myself and be an every game starter. And, and now it's about winning again. And so... Yeah, that I just remember the start of that second season, just just playing. I, I, the start of the second season 
was right after the 2011 Gold Cup. So I played every game of the Gold Cup, but the Gold Cup didn't end until July. And then I had three weeks off after that. So I showed up to Belgium maybe five days before the start of the season. So I didn't start the first game of the season. And I was kind of disappointed, but I also understood because I had missed all of preseason basically while, while getting some time off after the national team. And we lost away, I think, two to one to a team that had just been promoted from the second division. So Lucas Biglia had also kind of shown up late to, to preseason. And the two midfielders that started that game, they were out. And Lucas and I came back in for the second game of the season. And we went on a winning streak. And we literally played almost every game for the rest of the season. So things kind of worked out perfectly. But yeah, going into that second season, I was just I was ecstatic to be there and, and to really establish myself and try to win. Titles, a couple of them. What are the celebrations like? When Andrew like wins, what's the city like? What's the team like? What's the club like? What's your experience like? How does it change your life? Uh, it was amazing. It was the first time in my career where you put so much effort into something and it all comes at the end of the season and it's almost like this giant sense of relief and pride and accomplishment. So, And it happened in crazy fashion. The first time I think we had... Two games left in the season. We were playing Club Bruges at home, which is a big rival of ours, and we just needed a tie to win the title. And we were losing 1-0 the whole game. And in the 95th minute, um, we get brought down for a penalty. And so we've got a penalty basically to – there's literally no time left. Make the penalty and we're champions. And 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 my buddy Guillaume Gillet slides it in, and uh, we just went crazy. I, I just remember going nuts. We got the trophy like almost immediately. And – uh, the fun thing about Anderlecht is every time we won the title, we went to this same nightclub and, and the GM would always come at the beginning of the night and he'd buy this giant bottle of Ace of Spades, like one of those like yeah. 30 liter. Yeah, like the Magnum you can't yes. carry. Yeah, so you they'll pour it over your shoulder. And so we got that and, you know, we were drinking, we were partying, you know, all our wives were there down on the field with us first. And then we went to the nightclub and yeah, it was awesome. W what a great feeling. And then the fans. I remember the, I mean, you see this with a lot of guys, but I remember the chance. I remember the, you know, USA chance. I remember when you left and they honored you on the field. What was that relationship like? What made it special? Do you still feel that love from them? Yeah, I still probably, I'd say probably like more than half of like my Twitter and Instagram followers are all from Belgium. A lot of them try to, you know, a lot of them keep in touch and send messages and they were especially happy when I moved to Orlando because I was going to be wearing purple again. So they, 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 I think they feel connected to me at Orlando a little bit. Um, but they were awesome. It, it was just awesome to be in a place that I was the only American playing in the entire league. So any American flag I saw in the stadium, like that was for me. That that, that person brought that to, to show support for me. And so I remember at a certain point, uh, some people were bringing like California flags and, and my wife would sit in the stadium and after the game, she'd be like, I literally counted like 25 American flags in the stadium today. Like how amazing is that? Yeah. Um, so that part was really special. The people of Belgium, I've had a special connection with them. It's a small country and, and they're great people. And the neighborhood I lived in, you know, we went back last off season. We brought our daughter back who, who had been born there. We showed her where she grew up for the first year of her life. It's just a special place that I think we'll go back to every so often for the rest of our lives. You get stopped in the butcher store, butcher shop. <laughs> the butcher. <laughs> that's we, the that's the cliche, yeah. Like oh, yeah. I can't even I can't even buy a cutlet without getting it's funny from these. It's fans. funny because there was a little little grocery store that my wife and I used to shop at and the two guys that ran the grocery store were just giant Anderlecht fans so every time we went in it was talking about the game on the weekend and talking about the next game the following weekend and it was an interesting time last off season when I went back to Anderlecht because Roger Van Enstock had just sold the club to this new guy and the club was changing a lot and a lot of fans were not happy yep. and so I got to the airport in Brussels and we went through customs and as he looked at my passport he was like whoa we haven't seen you in a while welcome back you, you going to see the club it's not the same as when you left it because they haven't won the title in a couple of years either and things are changing and so every person I saw in Brussels was just like wow welcome back like I can't believe you still follow us and I'm like dude I, I'm gonna be here forever this is my club they brought me down on the field to do like the first kick before the game and the USA chants were coming back. And that was just a special moment for me and my wife and kids. So you have this connection and, and it's not just the league. You get to play Champions League too because when you win the league, that's what happens. What's it like to hear that, that anthem? It's something that not many American players get the opportunity to do. Yeah, that was amazing. My very first game in Champions League was at AC Milan. And so I remember telling my wife because she came to the game 
I was like, all right, when, when we're walking out onto the field and they play the Champions League anthem, j- just make sure you get like a whole two minute video, like record <laughs> this. This is going to, this, we're, we're going to watch this forever. I'm like, I, I've never watched it back, but I was like, you got to get this like ch- Champions League anthem, like on a recording. Cause this is, this is the moment, but a funny story. Well, not so funny. It was devastating at the time. We won the title in 2011 and so, or 2011, 12, going into 2012. So winning the league in Belgium at that time, and and I think you still do, you get an automatic spot in Champions League in the group stage. And so I come to New York straight from Belgium when my season ends for my bachelor party, to have my bachelor party here in New York. And while we're here on my bachelor party, the Champions League final for that season is about to be played. And so me and my buddies, we all go to watch the game at some bar around here. And it's Chelsea against Bayern Munich. And Chelsea had finished fifth in the Premier League that year. And champion, you know, UEFA changed the rule that year that if, because Chelsea finished fifth, if Chelsea wins Champions League final, they'll be in the group stage next season. And if they do that, Anderlecht gets dropped out of the group stage and they have to go through qualifying. And I don't know, Drogba or Robin misses a penalty or Drogba scores like in the last second to put it in overtime. And I just, I was just rooting against Chelsea so hard because I was like, now we have to go through qualifying and that's hard. It's... The, there are some games that are just tough. And so Chelsea wins, of course. And I'm like, all right, this is ruining my bachelor party because now I got to go back early to Anderlecht. We got to get ready for Champions League qualifying. But fortunately, we, we made it through qualifying and got to the group stage. So I got to ask about the Zlatan story. It's the famous one, 2013, trash talk with uh, now the LA Galaxy star. Just kind of go front to back for me here. Walk yeah. us through it. Well, I said this to you the other night. Um, so this was in 2013. We played the first game against PSG at Anderlecht. And Zlatan scored three goals in the first 30 minutes of the game. The third of them was the belter that goes up or V. That's like all over Instagram all the time. Uh, and our crowd gives him a standing ovation. And I'm just like, what is going on? We're, we're cheering for this guy now? Like, of course, he scored a hat trick. It's unbelievable. But like, I, I was so mad. And then the second half, he scored a fourth goal. And they beat us like 5-1 at home. So we go to PSG and I'm just like, I can't stand this guy. Like he, 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 he kicked our butts, like whatever it was six weeks ago. And he tackles me kind of hard or I tackle him and he gets up in my face and he's like, what is this? What is this on your face? This mustache so ugly. And I was like, you're talking to me about my, uh, my mustache with a nose that big. And he was like, who's talking about nose? Who's talking about nose? And I think he was very sensitive about his nose. I mean, I've got a big nose too, but his is a little bit bigger. But um, yeah, that was it. And then it's kind of just become this thing afterwards. Yeah. And him and I have never talked about it ever since. I mean, what's there to talk about at this point? Right? <laughs> you haven't got rid of the mustache, so props to you. Yeah. Stuck with it. That's your style. That's yeah. what's up. Yeah, he probably doesn't even know who I am. He's like, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. Another guy with a mustache wearing a purple jersey. What do you know? Yeah. So let's talk about Major League Soccer before I let you go here. And uh, Jesse Marsh, it comes full circle. You go to the Red Bulls. You guys have some incredible seasons. And I heard you say on Binion Sal that you wanted to be a coach. And maybe not soon. You also want to play through your 40, and that's six years from now. And yeah. I- I'm very curious to see if you can do that. Yeah, me too. Rooting for you on that one. Thanks. Jesse Marsh, the coach, when you go into Red Bull, what do you see? What do you feel? His sort of profile, his place in the American soccer world, his place in soccer overall has grown so much since then. Yeah, I mean, he was one of the major reasons why I came to New York. Uh, Him and I kept in touch over the years, you know, um, always had remained friends, always talked about soccer, always talked about different things. And so when he got the job, he reached out immediately and wanted to bring me uh, wanted to buy me basically and, and bring me back in and saw the, that I would be an important part of his team. So he convinced me right away. I didn't need that much convincing. It kind of came at a time when Anderlecht was going through a transition and and he brought me back and, and we had a great three years together. And I think he's an amazing coach. I mean, we've all seen this video that's gone viral of him coaching Salzburg now in the Champions League at halftime against Liverpool. And the way he motivates guys, the way he thinks about the game, the way he pushes the game, the way he pushes the players every day, you know, I, I like to be pushed. And so he, he was definitely a big influence. And I think if I can have a lot of success uh, in early in my career as a coach like he has, you know, uh, I, I'd be very I, I'd be doing a very good job, I think. I think one of the things that sticks out to me with him is not like the tactical stuff. It's not the on field stuff. It's the understanding psychologically of how you motivate people, not players, people. How did he motivate you? You say you like to be pushed. Well, how? I think he just put a lot on my shoulders and said, look, you know, 
a lot of this is going to depend on you. A lot of our success is going to depend on you. And I wanted that and I needed it and I thrived off it while also, while also making me feel like I was the best player in the league. So it's a lot of pressure when someone says, look, the team's only going to go as far as you're going to take us. Um, but also he made it clear that 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 was basically our plan. And he made it clear to the guys, listen, we're going to be in some tough games and there's going to be tough moments on the field where there's going to be turnovers. But when you get the ball and you want to keep the ball, give it to Sasha. And so to have a coach say that to you and say that to the whole team, I mean, it does, it does wonders for your confidence. So I don't know if I ever felt more confident than the times I played for Jesse Marsh because he just made me feel like I was on top of the world. You want to be a coach? You look at what Jesse's accomplished, what Bob has accomplished. They've both been trailblazers. What do you hope your coaching career looks like? What do you dream about when you think of that future for yourself and how might you go about trying to accomplish it? You know, to be honest, I don't really dream about coaching yet. I, I still think I have a lot to give as a player. Um, I know it's kind of been like a half joke, half serious that I want to play until I'm 40. You know, I'm, I, I, I seriously do. I don't know if I can make it that far, but I want to play as long as I can. So I do think that I have at least a few more years left. So I've started to think about coaching in ways just about, you know, how I would want my team to play and what my training sessions would look like. But I've, I haven't had a dream of like me standing on the sidelines in, uh, in, in Manchester United Stadium coaching against them or anything like that. I, I don't dream about that. I dream about playing still. Uh, I really only, I, uh, I only dream about playing. <laughs> I've got no, no dreams of being a coach. I think that will change as I still get a little bit older. But yeah, like I've said, I, I'm so focused on playing still that that's most important. Bob helped Jesse. Do you have any thoughts of like, hey, where's Jesse going? I, I can be a good assistant coach. Uh, it's funny because Jesse texted me probably six months ago and was like, hey, I heard a nasty rumor that you might want to be a coach. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so he's like, come over and visit me in Salzburg and let's let's talk, you know, let's talk about stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, I, I'm definitely going to come visit you and I'm going to watch what you do and I'm going to take notes. I don't know if I'm going to do it this off season. I might wait another year or two, but I know he's definitely going to be a mentor for me going forward in the coaching world. We'll see what the future holds. Sasha Kleschen, MLS Story Time. It's been a pleasure, man. Congratulations on your career so far. Maybe six more years. However many, however many, many of the body, the mind, and everything else holds up. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks so much, man.